Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> Who is the King of Glory? When I say those words, does anyone's mind go to Handel's Messiah? Right? Yeah. Who is the King of Glory? From Psalm 24. Well, we get a full image of the King of Glory in the three readings today that are a part of Christ the King Sunday that was instituted in 1925 by uh, Pope Pius XI. It was after the First World War. There was political turmoil. What's new? Uh, what's old is new again. Uh, and so the focus was to return people uh, away from politics as a solution to Christ the King as the only true solution. Uh, the Pope says Jesus Christ reigns over the minds of individuals by his teachings and their hearts by his love in each one's life by living according to his law and imitating his example. So today from the prophet Jeremiah and from the letter to the Colossians and the Gospel of Luke we have images of Christ the King. The progression is fascinating because the prophet Jeremiah speaks about a shepherd that will gather and not scatter. And then there's the uh, prophecy about the branch coming up from David's line who will be the righteous shepherd, the righteous king who will rule properly. Then Jesus, king of the Jews, crucified on Calvary. And finally, Jesus, the king of glory. So today we will look at the identity of the king and then the results of the king's reign. And then lastly, a question posed, where does the king reign? All wonderful on this Christ the King Sunday. You know, there is a certain irony that we speak about Jesus being a king, uh, born 2,000 years ago in a very remote village in the Roman province, uh, who didn't have much going on for 30 years. He worked in construction, basically, carpentry and things like that, took care of his mom after his dad died, according to tradition, only had a three-year uh, shelf life as a preacher of the kingdom of God in and around Galilee, uh, was crucified at age 33, had no money, no books, commanded no army, wielded no uh, political power whatsoever, never traveled that far from his home. Yet this is Christ the King, the King of glory. We have to appreciate and enjoy that irony and the irony actually gets even deeper than that. 600 years before Christ came, the prophet Jeremiah was speaking the word of the Lord and the word of the Lord is that the shepherds of Israel along with the priests, the whole ruling elite of Israel were totally corrupt. And their corruption internally was leading to the exile of the people. Jeremiah implicates the shepherds of Israel and not Babylon with the exile. Now this is absolute devastation. The temple was destroyed. This is not the temple after Jesus. This is hundreds of years before. The temple was destroyed. People were brought into exile uh, in Babylon. There was devastation, uh, the likes of which none of us have any, any part in. We couldn't, we couldn't understand invading armies into this country, leading us to some other place and just destruction all around. We can't even imagine it. It's hard for us to even get in touch with that, but that's what happened to them. Well, the implication was is that these leaders have failed so miserably, there is discipline and exile, but Jeremiah saw over the horizon 
And that horizon is good, <laughs> good news, because God is going to raise up a shepherd that's going to gather the sheep instead of uh, scatter them. It's going to bring them and heal them instead of let them go to slaughter. And that's really good news. And so that's what we have in our passage from the prophet Jeremiah. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. This king has a name. The Lord is our righteousness. And that's really, really good news. When we get to Luke's vision uh, account of Jesus, we have the deeper irony because Luke is revealing the king and N.T. Wright says it's like there's a, a painting that has a, uh, a great uh, cloth over it and Luke is pulling the cloth off of this painting and people get a look at this painting and they gasp because there's a king in this painting. There's a king that embodies the justice, the loyalty, and the salvation of God. But this king is not on a throne. This king is not in regal clothes. This king is in fact on the throne of the cross, naked. This king is in fact forgiving those who are crucifying him. This king is actually allowing the criminal to his side to enter into his kingdom into paradise. This is truly amazing. Just think of this. We're used to kings or at least presidents or people of high elected office of having nice things. They have power. They have privilege. They have things at their disposal. They have people to do things for them. Not this king. Not this king. God's king dies for the people. One more image about the identity of the king, and it's from the letter to the Colossians. If you want to know not only that the king we believe in, Jesus, is in fact the son of David and the righteous branch and the king that God called uh, by Jeremiah, but this king is also the son and the word of God. Just listen to this list of who the king is. The king is in fact the image, the icon of the invisible God. If you want to see what God looks like, there's an icon, there's a picture of him, Jesus. And the picture, of course, with Luke is God on the cross, the God-man on the cross. He's the firstborn of all creation, for in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, everything visible and invisible, thrones, dominions, rulers, or powers, all things have been created through him, through the Son and Word of God, and all things are created for him. Have you ever heard the expression, this is not about you? <laughs> or the world doesn't revolve around you, right? And we need that corrective often, right? Because we get caught up in ourselves. Well, guess what? The universe was created by Christ for him. This is his universe. He's the king of glory. It belongs to him. And he earned it. He earned it by the cross. Not only did he create it, he's cleansed it, he's healed it, he's restored it, and there's a new creation, a new heavens, and a new earth on the way. Well, let's keep going because this is too good. He himself is before all things. Christ holds the universe together. He's the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. He is, in our humanity, the first to move through death into eternal life and resurrection so that he may have first place in everything. In him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him 
God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether in earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. That's a pretty good resume for the king of the Jews, the king of glory. So we know the identity of the king. The king is the God-man king, the king who lays down his life for his subjects, and the king that allows a thief who recognizes his kingship to sneak into paradise on his very last day. However you get there, you want to get there to be with Jesus. Well, we know the results of his kingship uh, have basically brought all things together. There's the reconciliation of all things. The reconciliation between God and man, the reconciliation between heaven and earth, the reconciliation between all people, the reconciliation eventually between us and this creation itself. And so it's an immense, immense activity of the justice or righteousness of God that Jesus has undertaken. Well, just uh, before we leave that and move on to our third point, Thomas Hopko mentions that the king must do two things. The king must do two things. The first is the king must be ready to sacrifice himself for his people. And then the second is the king must destroy the enemies of his people. Now that's interesting language. Uh, the new covenant, he says, the enemies of God are not the nations. They are not people. The enemies of God are sin, not the sinners. The king gives his life for the sinners. You wanna know what the enemies are? The enemies that Christ as the king has to destroy are sin, disease, injustice, impurity, evil. And the last enemy to be destroyed, do you know what it is? Is death. So those are the enemies that the king destroys so his people can move from the dominion of darkness and sin and death and be transferred into the kingdom of his beloved son. So this is the action of the entire Passover mystery, the Paschal mystery that we share in the death of the king. When we're baptized, we are put into communion and union with Christ, his death and his resurrection and transferred into the kingdom of God's beloved son. And this is all happening as an act of God, the Lord, our righteousness, does it for us, and we enter into it simply by faith and by baptism. It's an amazing, amazing thing. Well, let's look uh, thirdly now at where the king reigns. Christ is reigning right now in heaven. After the resurrection, he is ascended into heaven, the abode of God, and is at the right hand of the Father. That is royal language about sitting on the, the ruling uh, throne with God the Father. And Christ will return and finish this whole process of reconciliation uh, with the resurrection and then the judgment and the entrance into the new heavens and the new earth. Uh, so that's where we are headed. Now, uh, so Christ reigns in heaven now and all Christ has to do is to appear or return, depending on how you translate the Greek word parousia, to institute and finalize and fulfill everything he has already accomplished. So it could happen very quickly. But in the meantime, Christ is reigning in heaven and his body is on earth. And so guess what? Christ reigns through his body in the ways that it, it is possible here in this world. 
So Christ the King reigns in us through his body in the power of grace, in the power of charity, in our generosity, and in our humble sacrifice, because that's how the world will see that we are children of the King. That's how the world will experience the fact that we are connected to the King who has offered his life for the people, laid down his life for his subjects. We serve the King out of love. And so we in the church, we have to have a different mode of being and a different way of relating than the world so that we may actually be a part of the revelation that we're supposed to be. N.T. Wright says the church is not supposed to be a society of perfect people doing great work. Isn't that good news? Uh, and now we strive for excellence, that's true, but we are not a, a society of perfect people doing perfect work, are we? He says it's a society of forgiven sinners repaying their unpayable debt of love by working for Jesus' kingdom in every way they can, knowing themselves to be unworthy of the task. I think he's right on target. We are simply people who are forgiven sinners, seeking to follow the king, seeking to be generous, seeking to help others, seeking to lay down our lives in small ways for others. And you know, we do that. We have ongoing efforts to help those in need almost all year long. We have those efforts going on in this side of town and in another side of town all year long. We are constantly doing efforts for charity, for empowerment, for growth, to get kids to camp, to get kids to college. We are doing many of those things, and those are all activities of the kingship of God in this world. Those are all activities of justice, of setting things right in the ways that we can. And for many years now, we have given away in and through this community, 10% of our budget to those in need. And that is a beautiful, wonderful thing. And it's not to be uh, taken lightly or forgotten. We must continue to do that though, because that's the way that we reveal that we are children of the King. You know, the last sentence of our scriptures for the whole season of Pentecost is truly I say to you, you will be today with me in paradise. What a fitting way to end that season of, para, uh, of, of uh, Pentecost with those wonderful words. The king offering the kingdom and the kingship to the thief. We'll take Jesus the king up on his offer, won't we? Because we're able to say that shortest creed that is found in the New Testament, Jesus is Lord. And if Christ is our King, guess what? We will rule with Him. We'll have a place on His throne and share His glory and His kingship. So on this Christ the King Sunday, let us worship the King and follow Him into His kingdom. Amen. Thank you.